Most welcome to the Stockholm Summit 2022 uh, uh, for the World Academic Forum uh, and the session One SAR and Free Patriarchs, which is hosted by the University College Stockholm, uh, where we are located at the, at the moment for this session. And today we will discuss the events in Ukraine. And for this reason, we have uh, professor Cyril Havarun, Professor in International Relations and Ecumenism, or Ecclesiology International Relations and Ecumenism, uh, who is an expert in the field of Ukraine. He comes himself from Ukraine, born in Ukraine, and has also been working closely to the center of the Moscow Patriarchate and knows well what is going on in these churches that are concerned. And on my right side, we have Jose Sverker. He is a senior lecturer in systematic theology and church history and has been dealing with Ukrainian issues also. And myself, I'm the Dean of the Faculty for Eastern Christian Studies at the University College Stockholm, which comes close to this subject. So I give with these few introductory words, the floor or the screen <laughs> to uh, uh, Professor Sir Havron. Thank you. Uh, I hope it is unmuted. Yes, it is unmuted. Thank you, Michael, for the words of, of introduction. Thank you for coming to this session. Thank you, thank you those who uh, tune in uh, online. Um, I just want to uh, say, uh, Michael said that I know what is going on in Ukraine, in Ukraine, in the Russian church. Actually, there is a difference between knowing and understanding. I probably know, but not always understand what is going on. Um, also, I'm happy that we have this hybrid session, actually. I believe very much in the online post-pandemic uh, uh, new methods of, of teaching. And uh, uh, I think it's a great opportunity to uh, extend our audiences. Um, and a special, therefore, the special thanks to those uh, who physically came because it, it now requires extra effort and uh, almost like um, a huge exercise. Um, first of all, don't ask me why is one Tsar and three Patriarchs. Who are those three Patriarchs? I don't have a clue. Uh, it's rather a symbolic number of Patriarchs, which means that there is a sort of church power, church authorities, and one Tsar. Well, we, we may assume that it's Vladimir Putin who plays the role of the Tsar, and he somehow deals with the, with the church. And actually, my presentation will consist of two parts. One is really boring, and another one is more entertaining, I hope. The boring part of it will be uh, going deep into the past, and I will try to explore some um, uh, trends, some features of the church-state relations um, in the tradition that continues to our days, and we actually, in Sodetalia, uh, in the framework of this school, University College of uh, College Stockholm, we study uh, this tradition, rather tradition, Eastern Christian traditions, and we try to make sense out of how the past influences the, the present. And actually, it will be the focus of my presentation, how those old patterns of Byzantine symphony, symphonic relationship between the church and the state, uh, still underpin what is going on in, in this war. And uh, in general, uh, generally in, uh, in that part of the world where the obscure one, incomprehensible one, uh, from where many of us teaching and studying and uh, at uh, EHS come. Uh, I mean, Eastern, Southern Europe, the Balkans, uh, everything. I remember, I think it was Emperor um, Joseph of Austria used to say that the East begins at the edge of my balcony in Vienna. So everything to the east from the edge of the balcony of the um, Habsburg uh, dynasty is exactly the, uh, the field which we study and which uh, is impossible to uh, ignore if we want to understand what is happening in Ukraine. And this war is indeed underpinned uh, by, uh, uh, by the centuries long traditions. Um, and at, at the core of my presentation and at the core of the developments, historical developments nowadays is an idea which has been called, branded as symphony or symphonia. 
uh, which has nothing to do with music, of course, unfortunately, uh, but it uh, means um, uh, it means harmony, concordia. Uh, that is the the um, um, uh, or consonancia. That is the Latin equivalent to this Greek word symphonia, which means the harmony of sounds of uh, of of uh, of voices. And uh, we understand this ter term uh, very particularly as under, uh, as framing or expressing the good wish about the harmony and relations between the church and the state. Um, the modern interpretations of, uh, interpretations of symphony that stand behind the new models of relations between the church and the state in such countries as Russia present the relationship between the church and the state as harmony of equal partners. In reality, however, these interpretations camouflage the struggle between the church and the state for which one, uh, each one's own good. Uh, the benefits of the state seeks um, from symphony as, uh, uh, include the practices when the church becomes instrumental for political propaganda or facilitates the legitimization of the political regimes, as this is clearly the case of Russia. The benefits for the church include uh, partial or full financing from public funds, as well as ex exemption from taxation and sometimes even from laws. Indeed, these elements in the modern church-state relationship can be traced back to the Byzantine era. So on the one hand, we have a, an ideal picture, a romantic picture of symphonic relationship, relationship between the church and the state. And on the other hand, we have a, a very rough reality of the uh, very complicated relationship. Um, I, it happens. It's against my will, but I have to give a lot of interviews last kind of months, explaining the complications between the in the relations between you know the Patrick and uh, and uh, Putin in Russia, and uh, I usually face a stereotype that people see that this is a kind of Byzantine symphony, this kind of ideal uh, uh, relationship, almost like between two lovers, you know, who are. Uh, you know, fully embrace each other and uh, have this exactly symphonia in the relationship with one another. And this, this stereotype is completely wrong, because as far as I understand, as far as I know, it's far away from any symphony, any kind of love relationship between the two. I call it usually the marriage of convenience and not a marriage of love. Uh, it's indeed a, an a, co a, co co a kind of co co coincidence, uh, conflation of very different, sometimes opposite interests that two personalities and two institutions, the church and the state project uh, and uh, exercise. And therefore each, each one gets benefits from, another, from the partner. And uh, I believe the partnership will continue as long as far as they will continue having benefits from each other. The moment they stop having benefits from each other, probably they, this relationship will fall apart. But let's go back to Byzantium uh, for maybe next 10, 15 minutes, and then I'll come back to uh, this marriage of convenience in the Kremlin in Russia that we are talking about. So the Byzantines did not call the relationship between the church and the state symphony. So it's kind of our modern usage of the word from over th uh, i've in, i've studied like all the instances of this word symphonia in the thesaurus lingua greca which is the major uh, source of greek texts available online also and there are almost no references to the relationship between the church and the state behind this word symphonia during the entire period of the supposed symphony between the church and the state which lasted for over 1000 years uh, the modus vivendi was not called symphony, actually. Symphony meant other things, such as agreement, pact, or concourse, as well as the state of consent within the churches or within the politia or the state, but not between them. So the Byzantines often spoke about symphonia within the church, kind of no, no much trouble in relations between the uh, jurisdictions, for example, you cannot call symphonia what is happening in the Orthodox 
uh, churches like in Sweden, for example. So from the Byzantine pers perspective, they would never call it symphonia, uh, what is happening you know, uh, between the jurisdictions now in Sweden. Um, the Byzantines also apply the word symphonia to describe, to emphasize the harmony in relations between different branches of power, of political power within the state. But they did not call symphonia the relationship between the two entities, between the two um, uh, authorities or institutions, the church and the state. Nevertheless, the relationship between the church and the state constituted the core of the Byzantine political philosophy. Its father is considered to be Eusebius of Caesarea, uh, who died in 339. Um, well, of course, everyone knows that Eusebius was a church historian, right? He wrote this ecclesiastical history, which constitutes the main source of our knowledge about the period of persecutions, about the uh, early, uh, uh, early era before Constantine and the early era after uh, or during the Constantine rule. Um, but essentially, it seems I, I need to dump my, my kind of text. I will just try to improvise. So essentially, Eusebius was not really a historian. He was a spin doctor. Uh, we call nowadays those people like political uh, technology, uh, kind of technologists. Uh, they invent things instead of describing them. Uh, and Eusebius, he certainly invented the future of the Byzantine Empire. He envisaged this future, and actually it happened quite coincidentally that the Byzantine Empire followed his, his vision. But the, Eusebius also invented his past. And uh, uh, all his stories about the persecutions and about you know, the life of the church uh, before, before Constantine, it's, it's fiction. Uh, of course, he used a lot of documents, for which reason, uh, his history is extremely valuable for us because that sometimes or often or in, mon in most cases that is the only source of documentation about the early era but as regards the interpretation the hermeneutics of those documents that Eusebius offered it's fictional uh, so he invented both the past and the future of the church and he was extremely su successful in both inventions uh, so we still use his invention his vision of the past of the church before him, and we still rely on it. Nowadays, we, by applying critical approach, we understand that he was really fictional. Um, he was a kind of a, a science fiction writer. Uh, but for centuries, you know, people really took for granted whatever he wrote. And uh, uh, the generations after Eusebius actually followed his vision, vision of the empire, including his vision of the Symphonia. Again, symphonia was not the word used by Eusebius. He actually, Eusebius used symphonia <clears throat> in order to uh, emphasize the um, correspondence between the uh, ostensibly controversial parts of the Holy Scripture. So he actually tried to, uh, to produce a sort of con concordia of the uh, passages from the Scripture, not, not more than that. And he called that symphonia. Um, and Eusebius, of course, invented this whole thing about the conversion of Constantine and his faithfulness to the tradition and so forth, because we understand that, well, we, we don't really know what Constantine believed and what he wanted, because we don't have sources that describe actually his, his actual wishes and desires. Uh, it should be remembered that Eusebius, unlike, for example, uh, another Eusebius of Nicomedia, who was really a courtier, he's, he stayed in the court of, the, uh, of, of, of Constantine. Uh, imagine he, he would have been a teacher in EHS because it is next to Drottingholm, to the kind of royal palace. So he was really close to royal palace, Eusebius of Nicomedia. But Eusebius of Caesarea, the author of the church history, he lived far away. I don't know, in Lulia, somewhere far away. And he actually pretended to know what was going on in the court. And he described what was going on in the court as if he knew what was going on. And he was wrong. Uh, so his idea of symphony did not correspond to the vision of Constantine. Uh, we don't know what Constantine envisaged. We don't know whether he was really, you know, a convinced Christian, because 
we know that and we don't know when he stopped believing in 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 the god sun for example the sun god this uh, solar deity introduced from syria to uh, to the roman empire and uh, so it's a completely obscure figure but eusebius actually created this narrative about this byzantine symphony and this this uh, narrative idealistic narrative of the byzantine symphony continued through um, uh, through ages i'd like to uh, emphasize to suggest that probably uh, constantine uh, was interested in supporting this kind of vision or at least his successors especially such as Theodosius, who lived in, late in the fourth century. Uh, uh, they were supportive in the Eusebius' uh, vision of symphony because uh, they cared about everything that their pagan predecessors, uh, predecessors cared, like, for example, to preserve control over the empire, to enhance its integrity, which was permanently challenged, and to make satisfied with his rule as many as people as possible. The uh, second and the third points interests uh, uh, were conditioned by the first point. They guaranteed that the emperor had an ha a heavenly mandate. So essentially for the pagan Roman emperors and for the Christian successors to them, it was crucially important to have this kind of extra legitimacy, extra layer of legitimacy for themselves, which they could present as a heavenly mandate for their rule that uh, enab enabled them to, to rule. And Constantine certainly believed that Christianity would help him pursuing this uh, uh, goals, particularly their legitimacy. And <clears throat> I would argue, just let me jump back to our time. I think that Putin pursues the same kind of things. Uh, he is concerned about the integrity of his empire. Um, he uh, con he's concerned about um, uh, <clears throat> um, about legitimacy for himself. In the democratic countries, legitimacy comes, stems from elections. Russia doesn't have elections. Therefore, the regime there needs some extra layers of legitimacy, and it comes from the church. That's where I think uh, Putin kind of intuitively uh, borrows from, from this tradition. And the third point uh, is that, um, indeed, the Byzantine emperors, the Roman emperors, were populists fundamentally kind of intrinsically populist. The, the, most, the most famous populist among all the emperors was actually uh, Julius Caesar himself. He played with the people of Rome. Uh, he tried to kind of flatter with them. He tried to uh, communicate with the people of Rome over the head of the Senate, and he actually wanted to obliterate the Senate. He was really a populist to the bones. And many uh, emperors continue, if you take Nero, he even, he became such a populist, he, he tried to entertain people personally as an actor. That was an act of populism. So it was essentially very much kind of populism was very much embedded in the, this philosophy of the post-Republican imperial Roman uh, state. And the Christian emperors were, were not an exclusion, an exception from that. And, um, they really try to appease people, to, to please people. Uh, the, the, the kind of uh, 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 the ochlos, and uh, they are they were populist. In this regard, Putin is certainly also a populist. Uh, also, in the uh, at least in the during the uh, second two terms of his uh, tenure, because he began his rule uh, his kind of tenure as a president in two thousand. Uh, not playing a role of a populist, but playing a role of, I call it, uh, it's a role of, you know, uh, the Gulf princess. Essentially, they say, our people are crazy. They're going to, you know, to blast you. But we can contain them. We are above them. Yes, you, you have, excuse us, we, you have to forgive our, some misdeeds, being totalitarian, being a bit autocratic, but that is the only way, you know, to deal with those people. Uh, the alternative is much worse than our autocratic rule. That is the role of this, this Gulf kind of royals uh, in the Gulf countries, uh, uh, that they play this role and sometimes they kind of, they manage to sell this role to, to the West. Uh, Putin actually in the first two terms of his presidency, he played the same role. He essentially said, all those people, they just emerged from the Soviet Union, they're quite crazy. 
uh, they can cause you a, a lot of trouble, but I can contain them. I can manage them. So trust me, I can, you know, do some nasty things like what I, he did in Chechnya, uh, but just keep a blind eye on, eye, on, eye on that. He changed when he came to power in the, for the third term of his presidency in 2008, when he started to play a populist, he became a populist. He said, okay, you don't accept my role as a mediator between those crazy people and the West, then I will do represent the people. I will think and I will uh, do according to what they will, what they want me to do. And actually, uh, he started, I think he turned to a populist and um, he, uh, um, um, uh, actually this populism led to where it is because uh, he has a complete backing, complete support of the Russian people in the war. Uh, of course, those social, sociological polls that they have, they cannot be trusted because uh, they are not independent, but still they indicate that a vast majority uh, of the Russian population uh, supports um, uh, Putin, supports the war, and I think it is not a manipulation, it is true, it really corresponds to the reality, and uh, Putin still is a very popular person. Um, so, um, just let me decide what to skip in this description. Yeah, let me come back to, uh, in order to prove another point, uh, to argue for another point uh, from the modern Russian history, in addition to this similarity between the Byzantine or Roman populism and Putin's populism. Uh, let me uh, jump back again uh, to, to prove one point, that even though symphony was regarded as a kind of ideal relationship between the church and the state, in reality, it was not ideal. Uh, eventually, the state always prevailed in the relationship between the church and the state. Uh, the state always took an upper hand. And uh, I think uh, one of the testimonies uh, can be found, well, there are many testimonies to that, but I'd like to refer to one of them. It comes from the 13th century uh, from uh, uh, um, a treatise by Nikiforos Lenidis, a Byzantine uh, writer who wrote Vasilikos Andreas, a statue of a king. Um, where he described an ideal king, uh, kingship. Um, and uh, this treatise was transferred to us uh, through George uh, Galesiotis. And Galesiotis, on behalf of Limidia, speaks about the subjects of the king uh, who praise and inaugurate him, I mean, the king, exclaiming in symphonia, there he uses the word symphonia, this one, the king is the, wise, the wisest, the most gentle, and made like God. So he said that in Symphonia, all the subjects of the king, including the patriarchs, including all those three patriarchs, that's why we use probably this term three patriarchs, because there are many of them, and there is only one Tsar, only one emperor, who is praised by everyone in Symphonia as being like God. Uh, I'd like to refer to another uh, 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 piece of the late Byzantine political philosophy, uh, which was articulated by uh, the Patrick of Constantinople, Anthony IV, uh, in, the, in the 14th century. Uh, he wrote a letter to um, uh, Grand Duke of Moscow, Basil I. Well, Moscow was still kind of a small principality at the time, not very much significant. And uh, uh, of course, uh, well, the patriarchs in Constantinople had a lot of arrogance to those barbarians and uh, instructed them, you know, as, ch as children in a school. And uh, Anthony IV actually wrote a letter with instructions how to perceive the imperial power of the Byzantine kings uh, by everyone, including by the princi uh, uh, princi uh, principles of, uh, of Moscow. Uh, so the letter that he sent in 1393 um, was sent when the political authority of the Byzantine emperors was weakened and fragmented, and the new reality of the church deprived uh, the, of the imperial support, uh, uh, the church being deprived of the political support was lurking. So that was the period when the entire Byzantine uh, empire was collapsing. It was torn into pieces, and the only thing that remained 
of Byzantium, of old Byzantium, was ideology. And actually, Anthony IV uh, transmitted this ideology to Moscow. Um, and he tried to convince the Grand Duke of Moscow that nothing was going to change in the symphony that seemed eternal. Uh, the patriarchs at the time was, were not very much different from the patriarchs in our days. Then and now they just don't recognize the reality. And they just live in the ideal world, uh, world and they continue believing in those kind of fables as the one that I'm going to refer to. I quote, once more with grief, I have heard that your highness had said certain things about the emperor in derogation. Apparently Basil said, all those nuts you know, in Constantinople, they don't have any power, they don't have any real influence. Why should we give a dime about them? You know? uh, and Patrick says, that is bad. The emperor is not like local and provincial ruler, rulers and sovereigns, meaning like you, the barbarian. The emperors convoke the ecumenical councils. By their own laws, they sanctioned what the divine canon said about the correct dogmas and the ordering of the Christian life. They determined by their decrees the order of the episcopal sees and set up their boundaries. In other words, they shaped the entire administration of the church. It was not the church that the church had shaped this administrative structure, but the emperors shaped for the church what it had to be. The church ordained the emperor, anointed him, and consecrated him emperor and autocrat of all the Romans, that is, of all Christians. So all Christians were regarded as Romans, even those barbarians in Moscow. I mean, they were also regarded as Romans. And uh, Anthony said that the church actually did everything, and he used all the words which are usually applied to the consecration of bishops and ordination of priests and so forth. So Anthony applied this to the emperor. My most exalted and holy autocrat, is by the grace of God, the eternal and orthodox defender and avenger of the church, the eternal. So that, that was the idea that is going to last forever, even though it was collapsing in front of the kind of ice, this empire. Um, and in the end, Anthony said that the church cannot exist without the empire. That was the conclusion. That is the kind of also the bottom line of this entire political theology or political philosophy, you name it, of Byzantium. Now let us jump back to Russia. And in order to, uh, because that letter was uh, sent to Basil I of Moscow. And now we are living not in the uh, 14th century when this letter was uh, written by in the 21st century. And it seems that those instructions still somehow work, but in a very strange way. Uh, I would argue that uh, Russia is run by the people who play in construction games, you know, like those, you know, Vikings who come and drink, you know, beer, bottled beer, and you know, uh, uh, pretend they fight each other and barbecue. You know, I don't know, uh, do barbecues and they dress funny and uh, they think that they are like Vikings, but we know they are not Vikings. They are like, uh, I don't know. Uh, sellers or students or whatever, uh, but they pretend that they're Vikings. I would say that the Russian state is actually underpinned by this mentality of the animators, of the reconstructionists. Uh, it started uh, in 2014. One of the main figure in the Russian attack upon Ukraine, uh, Igor Girkin or Strelkov, well, Strelkov is kind of his uh, pseudonym. Um, uh, he, he was a, a, an active officer of KGB, and he uh, became a kind of convert to orthodoxy because he came together with the, they brought to Crimea at the time in 2013, they brought the belt of, of uh, uh, Virgin Mary from Mount Athos, from Atopedi Monastery to Crimea. Uh, it was brought by some Russian oligarchs together with the church hierarchs, and Igor Strelkov was actually in the guard of this belt. So he was like involved in the church things in Ukraine before, before 2014. And he reappeared in Ukraine as a leader of the Russian uh, guerrillas kind of troops that were not, they pretended not to be regulars, 
but they were, were like paratroops. And they actually were the fiercest, the, the cruelest troops that invaded. They invaded also uh, Donbass area and Silko personally executed some Ukrainians, has, it has been documented. And so he is really a criminal of war. He has been sanctioned by the Western powers. Uh, and the most interesting thing about him that he is, yes, a part of being that he is like a KGB uh, officer, that he is a convert, orthodox, whatever, that he became one of the cruelest criminals of war. He is a reconstructionist. He used to play those reconstruction games, uh, you know, representing the, uh, or they tried to reconst reconstruct the battles, the Russian imperial battles during the World War I. That was his kind of hobby. And this was interesting and indicative of the entire kind of ethos uh, of this war, because now in uh, um, uh, essentially 2022, what Putin tries to do, he actually reconstructs the World War II. They call it the Great Patriotic War. And actually, you can, if you if you follow this, the details of the strategies of the Russian military operation on the Ukrainian turf, you can identify some attempts attempts to um, imitate to mimic with the operations of the World War II, like some symbols. Well, I, I'm not talking even even about the symbols because they use some of the symbols symbols from the World War II. So essentially, for Putin, it's a sort of reconstruction of the World War II of the Great Patriotic War. And uh, what I want to argue in my uh, in the remaining time of my presentation is that essentially, uh, what we are now dealing with in the relationship between the church and the state in Russia is another reconstruction, a reconstruction of the Byzantine symphony, of the roles that were played by the emperors and by the church in the Byzant Byzantine era. Um, and there are many indications that actually prove this point. For example, um, I think in 2000, um, 16 in May 2016, Putin visited Mount Athos, and uh, he visited some monasteries. And during the service, during the liturgy, he was placed to, to the throne, which in the imperial times was used to uh, to host the emperors. And he was actually presented. He was filmed uh, as almost like a Basilev, as an emperor. And actually, that was uh, a, 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 the context through which this. A uh, visit of Putin to Mount Athos was presented on the Russian TV, uh, especially through the channel which was established by a Russian oligarch, Konstantin Malafeev, the channel called uh, Tsargrad TV. Tsargrad means Constantinople, it's the, the king's uh, city. Uh, so this is, the, uh, this is a Slavonic uh, word for, for Constantinople. And essentially, uh, the, even the name of this channel means that we now are the successors of the old Byzantine Empire. We now play the role of Constantinople, and we have our own Basilevs with us. And the main point, the main kind of ideological message of this channel, the entire structure of this channel, is made in order to emphasize that Putin is a new uh, Basilevs, a new Byzantine emperor. Uh, so it was a kind of uh, debut of this uh, Tsargrad channel when Putin went to Mount Athos in 2016. That was a debut for the channel to, to present, to manifest their credo, their uh, main ideological message. And it was exactly this kind of message of symphony. They wanted to reconstruct the symphony. The idea of symphony was also seriously discussed in the Russian think tanks, even those who were and who are still close to the Kremlin. Like for example, in October 2014, uh, there was a seminar at the Russian Institute of Strategic Studies, which was not, which is not a joke, but it's a, quite an important think tank in the structure of the political regime in, in Russia. And the topic of the discussion was state and the church is symphony between them possible today. And the conclusion of the seminar was that the patterns of symphony from the Byzantine Empire um, or from the medieval Russian state are possible even today. So that was the kind of conclusion of this think tank. And of course, this idea of symphony uh, also was supported by, th by some church hierarchs. One of the most prominent of them is now he is the Metropolitan of Pskov, Tikhon Shevkunov. And he's, well, he's believed to be the spiritual father of Putin, which is really uh, not true. Uh, and uh, 
but what is true is that he's one of the main ideologists uh, of, of, the, of Putin's regime together with the Patriot. And actually they compete with one another. Putin is smart enough not to have, to, not to allow to anyone to, to hold a monopoly on ideology. Even if ideology is the same, he tries to, uh, to have two, at least two competitors you know, to provide that ideology. And in this case, one of the competitors is Patriot Kirill himself, and another competitor is, is Metropolitan Tikhon Shukunov. So Shukunov in 2008, he was still an Archimandroid, just like myself. Um, he produced a movie. Uh, he called, uh, titled this movie, The Fall of an Empire, The Lesson of Byzantium. He completely uh, invented Byzantium. The historians criticized this movie, you know, severely, that the Byzantium that Shevkunov presented is completely fictional, does not correspond to the real thing at all. But uh, the movie had a tremendous success. It was translated into many languages and has become a kind of a symbol, a motto of Putin's regime after he came back to power in uh, 2008. Uh, oh, excuse me, 2012. And um, essentially, Shevkunov in this, mover, in this movie argued that the formula of the Byzantine success and long, uh, longevity consisted of a strong state, merciless oppression of the separatist movements, anti-Westernism, and the symphony between the church and the state. So he suggested that is the formula of success. He said to Putin, if you want to be as successful as Constantine or other Byzantine emperors, just follow this formula be anti-Western, oppress the separatist movements, uh, support the church and support the state and support the relationship between them. And it, it seems that this symphony somehow is being implemented or reconstructed. Well, uh, in 2016, I will conclude uh, now, I think I've exhausted my limits somehow. Uh, I published an article in the church, uh, in the, um, Journal of the Church and the State, um, um, which is titled, Is Byzantine Symphony Possible Today? Where are, I argue that this symphony is impossible nowadays. So all those are good wishes only. Those are just, you know, romantic uh, perceptions of the symphony that, that cannot work in our time. Well, to some extent, I think I was right, and to some extent, I was wrong in 2016. I believe that I was right in, uh, well, no, what I was wrong about. Uh, I was wrong because uh, I believe that the patterns of symphony are impossible nowadays. No, they are possible. They are being implemented now and we see them being implemented nowadays. But what I was right about is that those patterns are not sustainable. They are actually monsters. They are not organic, they are not natural. They are absolutely invented, absolutely out of head, absolutely, uh, fictional and therefore not sustainable. So they try to create a symphony and they construct a monster, which is far away from the original Byzantine symphony. I don't want to say that the original Byzantine symphony was ideal. It was also in a sense a monster, but it was organic. It was natural for its time. For our time, what they try to do is really uh, not working it's really disastrous and it's going to destroy both the church and the state as we know them now. So it, I mean, this idealistic, this romantic reconstructionist, uh, reconstructionist uh, attempt to create a symphony led to the collapse or is leading to the collapse of the two partners in the symphonic relationship, the Kremlin, I hope, sooner than later, and eventually the church, because the church is facing the same kind of difficulties. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Can you hear me? Is it okay? Yeah. So uh, I'm supposed to give a kind of not a different perspective, but a kind of counter perspective to what Professor Havarun has just uh, presented. I am not an historian like 
Professor Haverun. I am instead looking at how theology operates within a civil society. And which means simply that uh, I'm more interested in explaining the interaction between politics and theology in a way where we can explain the events within civil society. One of those things that uh, we can look upon in this war that is taking place in Ukraine is the creation of a mental and ideological borderline between various worlds. An invention that I highly doubt is real, but it has been created as real, not just by Russians, uh, but even from the Western side. What is happening in Ukraine upsets many, of course, but it has its origin in a new Cold War that began with the bombings of Serbia in 1999. Before the bombings, President uh, Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin developed personal friendship that paved the way for an icebreaker between the former arch enemies. However, this was before the attack on World Trade Center 9-11. 2001. The United States before 9-11 was still marked by what we might be called Fortress America or Fortress Americanism, similar to Fortress Catholicism before Second Vatican Council, for example. The United States largely saw the entire world as a single great enemy, with a few exceptions. Enemies were to be kept at a distance and the American countries south of the United States were seen as their sphere of interest, so to say. And they were overthrowing governments that could pose a threat to U.S. interests, both in Latin America and in the southern parts of America. And outside this geopolitical sphere of interest was then the economic sphere, which was also to be kept under control with oil supply, uh, other natural products, and high technology. The latter sphere of interest justify far-reaching control of countries far away from America. Bill Clinton was the first president of the end of the Cold War. Clinton combined fortress Americanism with the idea of a world free from abuse, as he himself put in a speech on March 23rd, 1999. Quote, I want to live in a world where we can be together with all our differences and where we do not have to worry about having to see scenes every night for the next 40 years with ethnic cleansing in any part of the world. This is what careless is sometimes is called the Clinton doctrine. In itself, it may seem like a desirable vision but in conjunction with the heavy protection of American interest, the vision becomes arbitrary. Ever since World War II, America first has been the hallmark of America. This has meant that devilish choices have been made all the time. In 1941, it was Hitler or Stalin. In 1972, it was Brezhnev or Mao. And in 1979, it was Samosa or, or, or Ortega. And elections have often been motivated by American interests. Or as Franklin D. Roosevelt seems to have said of a Nicaraguan president Samosa, quote, he may be a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. In recent times, it has been about different conflicts being treated differently, such as the massacres in Rwanda, that were allowed to continue without any intervention, or the ethnic cleansing in Karajina in August 1995, where the, the Serbs had lived for over 500 years, where they were expelled, or 150,000 Serbs were expelled in less than four days. Clinton most likely was sincere in his quest for a world free of ethnic cleansing, but with the policy of America first, the Clinton doctrine became arbitrary, which in turn instilled fear in the countries that were not allied with the United States. Countries like Russia, Serbia, and a number of other countries that were on the other side of Iron Curtain 
before the end of the Cold War, had a hard time relating to an unpredictable and from their own perspectives, self-rightless American action. In connection with the disintegration of Yugoslavia, the Clinton doctrine became a public doctrine. Yugoslavia collapsed and with it also the Yugoslav army collapsed. Suddenly several different groups operated independently of each other and the parliamentary chaos ensued, which in itself opened the door for both independent paramilitary groups and armies often under unclear command lines to commit horrific abuses and uh, horrible actions. But it is still unclear who ultimately gave the military orders to carry out these abuses. And even more important, it is still unclear for Serbia and the Serbs. There is no indication even that uh, uh, the abuses in either Bosnia or in Kosovo had any support among the people of Serbia, or that they were sufficiently aware of them when that it occurred. That doesn't take away the decision by the Hague Tribunal that has ruled that the incident in Srebrenica, for example, should be considered a genocide. That's a different discussion. If we go back beyond Clinton, the former Bush administration considered Yugoslavia no longer a priority area and primarily a European issue, completely in line with fortress Americanism. Clinton instead reacted strongly and saw the abuses in the Balkan as a crime against humanity. In 1994, Clinton wanted to pressure the Western European states to take actions against the Bosnian Serbs, but failed, which led to the Srebrenica massacre. There were legitimate reasons to intervene against the ongoing ethnic cleansing, but the trade-offs made were based on minimal or no loss of American interests. The preventive measures that could have been taken were not taken, and once action was taken, it took place in a way that made the entire Serbian people appear guilty, and they also violated international law. The bombing of Serbia became almost a matter of retaliation instead of an intervention to protect the people on the ground, which had then jeopardized American interests. The last result was that the entire people wondered why they bombed Serbia when they did not intervene in Krajina and bombed the Serbs instead of protecting those who needed protection in Bosnia and Kosovo? The answer is a complex uh, answer. The fortress Americanism was combined with the dream of a new world, two realities that often come, came in conflict with each other. This is the background of the war in Ukraine. The bombing of Serbia started a new Cold War. If NATO could bomb Serbia, it could do the same with Russia. If it was considered justified in defending American interests, despite all the beautiful words about the peaceful world. Instead of an icebreaker, a power struggle arose again between Russia and the United States, but which also brought along the churches, mainly then in Serbia and in Russia. So there is a connection between the actions of the United States and the West in Serbia and the current war in Ukraine. The 21st century meant an ideological separation between West and East. And they enlisted in the, in the East the help of various thinkers, including Samuel P. Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. And with the accession of Patrick Kirill in 2007, the Russian Orthodox Church took the lead in this ideological separation. And here we take the next phase in this development. If American arbitrary politics with the Clinton doctrine was the start of this conflict, with the accession of Patrick Kirill, a new development took place, where the ideological separation was furthered even more. Kirill himself stated the foundation of this separation as a moral separation, where the West, according to the 
than the metropolitan. Emphasized the rights of individual or the basic moral world, whereas he himself expressed it in a speech entitled Human Rights and Moral Responsibility in connection with Russian People's World Council Congress 2006. Quote, on the other hand, we see how, with the help of human rights, a cover is laid over lies and how one hurts religious and national feelings. In addition to this, ideas of being integrated with human rights step by step that are not acceptable, not only to Christians, but generally to those who have a traditional moral understanding of man. For the sake of the world, the Russian people must once again take their unique responsibility, continue argued again and again in several speeches. The Russian people must once be again become one, which also includes the unity of a Russian people with the state and the brotherhood of Russian people with other peoples within Russia. And through this free part unity, the Russian world or Ruski Mir could contribute to world reconciliation. He continued as a patriarch in Schumann 2014, actually the same year as when Crimea was annexed and also during the Congress of the World Council for Russian People. Patrick here himself explained what this internal mission would look like. Quote, the gospel says, every kingdom that is divided is destroyed and a city or a family that is divided cannot survive. To avoid this catastrophe within ourselves, we need to identify three challenges that challenge this council. These problems relate to each other and can together form a vertical hierarchy. One, assure the unity and consensus within the Russian people. Without this mutual understanding and unity, mutual understanding and unity cannot be achieved at the international level. Two, assure the unity between Russian people and the Russian state. Since the collapse of the Russian state in the 20th century was founded by various external factors and influences, which led to the Russian people coming into conflict with their own state. Three, assure the unity and consensus between Russian people and other fraternal peoples of our country. Here, it's clear that if a conflict be begins in Serbia with the bombings, it rapidly accelerates during the time of Patriarch Kirill. And there is historical background to Patriarch Kirill's vertical hierarchy. Peter the Great, and even more so the Catherine the Great, embraced the ideas of absolute enlightenment that Voltaire advocated. Simply put, the absolute enlightenment was the idea that enlightenment needed an enlightened monarch or similar to be realized. The ideas of democracy were seen here as a threat. If an enlightened monarch became dependent on the views of a majority, the public good will be lost by the ideals being lost in the compromise that democracy in practice presupposes. Instead of this compromise, Tsarist Russia justified a vertical hierarchy, which in turn justified an empire. In Tsarist Russia, the Tsar was the one who realized the true ideals and was the protector of the Russians. And the Russians in turn were protectors of the Slavs, who in turn were protectors of Christianity, which ultimately served as the protection of all mankind. Stalin and the Bolsheviks took over this vertical hierarchy, but instead of being the protectors of Christianity, the Slavs became the protectors of communism. And the Russians, as the most equal people among the Slavs, became the protectors of the Slavs. In the same way, the vision of a united Russia is now emerging from the ruins of a former Soviet Union. Putin's United Russia Party bears in its name the vision of a mission under Putin's leadership. The Russian people and the Russian nation are called to be the protectors of a united Russian people and a united Russian world, Ruskimir or Pax Russica. In this world, Patrick here and President Putin 
become symbols of a new united Russia, where state and church together take on this lofty calling to safeguard the true values of humanity through the unit of Russian people and Slavs. In light of this high call, Ukraine's path uh, <clears throat> or the choices that Ukraine has made pose a direct threat to the unity of Russian people. Here, the Russians themselves often make a distinction between Rasiski Narod and Ruski Narod. Both mean the Russian people, but while Rasiski refers to people of a Russian nation state, the latter one refers to the Russian people scattered among many nation states. In the latter understanding, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians are one and the same people, but for political reasons, divided into several nation states. The church has an important role to play in uniting the Russian people. Despite the political boundaries of the nation states, the church becomes the symbol of being a people, being one people despite political differences uh, of various nation states. The church becomes a symbol of being the unity for the Russian people. And through Putin's connection to Patriarch Kirill, the Russian state becomes the protector of a fate of entire Russian people, albeit divided into three independent states. The unit of Russian people, in turn, becomes protection for the other Slavic peoples, not least Serbia. In connection with Euromaidan, the Ukrainians chose to distance themselves from Russia's protection and rift arose in the unity of the Russian people. This, in turn, motivated Petro Poroshenko, Zelensky's predecessor, to advocate an independent Orthodox Church in Ukraine, free from Moscow's protection. Poroshenko, therefore, chose to stand behind Patriarch Filaret's fraction or faction in Ukraine, whose church broke away from Moscow Patriarchate and declared independence on its own, the so-called Kiev Patriarchate, when Ukraine became an independent country. Together with this church, Patriarch Bartholomew was courted to seek the recognition of his church by the Patriarch of Constantinople, which took place on the, on the terms set by Constantinople. As a result, a rift arose, not only politically, but also ecclesiastically, which could be likened to rift in the soul of a Russian people. The Moscow Patriarch responded immediately and broke communion with the Patriarchate of Constantinople, and also with those who recognized the independent church in Ukraine. Putin, in turn, expressed his support for the Moscow Patriarchate Church in Ukraine. Little Rus, or Little Russia, also known as Ukraine, was suddenly be, was suddenly, became suddenly the disobedient little brother who wanted to break up with his bigger brother, which in turn jeopardized not only Russia's interests, but also the future fate of humanity following the arguments and articulation by Patriarch Kirill. This was not, of course, not accepted in Moscow, and Patrick Kirill himself addressed the issue in connection with the emergence of his breakaway church in a sermon on the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, October 20th, 2019, prior to the war. Quote, Russia's existence is of great spiritual and cultural value, not only for you and me, but for all of humanity. We must urge in support for preservation of Russian people for the emergence of our new brothers. Not so much because this people is needed by the country, but also to a large extent because the country needs the people. Russia must exist and play its irreplaceable role in our common destiny, in the destiny of our descendants and throughout world history. Russia's special value, its special calling, is to be a stronghold of Orthodox Christianity, to preserve the Orthodox faith, the Orthodox tradition and culture, and Christian moral principles intact. Perhaps that is why the powers unite against the Russian Orthodox Church, when they want to separate the Greek Orthodox world from the Russian Church, when they want to destroy the unity of the Orthodox Church. We have reliable information that says what is happening in the Orthodox world is not a coincidence, not just the whims of religious figures whose minds have been obscured, 
This is instead the realization of a very specific plan aimed at separating the Greek world from the Russian world. According to these perpetrators, I cannot describe these strategies in any other way. The Russian church appears as some kind of soft power through which Russia influences the surrounding world. But why can Russia not share its spiritual gifts? Is it criminal? It can only be criminalized by those who seek to weaken and if possible, destroy Russia's influence, unquote. Constantinople justified the decision by saying that the Metropolitan Diocese of Kiev had never been transferred to Moscow, but was administered by Moscow as established by Patriarch Dionysius IV of Constantinople in 1686, and pro uh, provided that the Patriarch Constantinople continued to be remembered in its liturgies. This was the same attitude that Constantinople stated in 1924 when the Thomas, the decree that gave the Orthodox Church of Poland its independence, was established. However, Moscow has never acknowledged this decision or follow it, but instead claims that the Russian Orthodox Church has remained independent since uh, rejecting the unity of ancient Rome and the new Rome, Constantinople, from 1439 at its local church meeting in 1448. It's very long back, they are thinking. And in practice became the Third Rome. That's why they call themselves the Third Rome. Constantinople, in fact, recognized this independence in 1589 and named the Moscow Metropolitan Patriarch, which was later confirmed by the older patriarchs in 1593. Patriarch Tikhon's formal title, in fact, was ordered before 1686, Patriarch of Moscow and all major and minor and white Russians, that is Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. As Constantinople issued its Thomas on the independence of Ukrainian Orthodox Church in 2018, the Moscow Patriarch broke communion with Constantinople and with all churches that recognized the independence of a new church. Alexandria's Patriarchate was, uh, was the church that was hit hardest with uh, 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 with the Moscow uh, that was more effect, affected by the Moscow Patriarch conflict, uh, where the Russians intervened in Africa and have started their own churches and parishes today. Metropolitan Lina Fier has even said that Constantinople's intrusion into Russian people's internal affairs could mean a permanent schism if Constantinople does not give up its claims in Ukraine. So it's a very, very strict conflict, both politically and ecclesiastically concerning Ukraine. In the light of above, the war in Ukraine will be a common concern for the church and the state on a metaphysical level. As Patriarch himself puts it, Serafim Osarov's vision of an inner peace where thousands will be saved in Patriarch Kirill's intention will be the unity of a Russian people is manifested in a Russian Orthodox church leading to the salvation of mankind. And this connection between the unity of a Russian people, the unity in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia will effectuate the salvation of mankind. He has said this repeatedly in several lectures and sermons. The fight for the unity of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia is the fight for the salvation of mankind. Russia, however, made a miscalculation. The war was intended to be a liberation of oppressed Russian speakers, especially in the Donbas regions, and a manifestation of Russia's greatness. Kiev would receive Putin with respect and who would surely arrive at Borisbill International Airport outside Kiev. Instead, the war has become a testimony uh, to the real division of the Russian people, already manifested in the ecclesiastical division in the same way as in the 16th century Western Europe when the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches were divided. The unity of, of the Russian people no longer rests in Moscow, but has returned to Kiev after half a millennium. A united Orthodox Church in Ukraine will challenge Moscow to reconsider its position. If one chooses to make the same mistake as Sweden did in the 18th century, where the idea of being a great power became more important than political realities. 
then Russia will soon be as lonely as uh, Charles XII's Sweden became after its insane wars. If one instead chooses to see the unity of humanity, the unit of Slavs and the unit of Russian people, not as a given greatness, but as a result of humanitarian work based on mutual respect, common understanding, and security for the individual, then the mosaic of humanity emerges as a picture of Christ, the Almighty, whose power rests in the cross and not in the perpetrator. Then Russia's greatness comes into its own and becomes an important and indispensable part of the mosaic that makes up humanity. Then Raskimir might be a true human and unifying value, but imposed from on high, it becomes a destructive force in locating the entire conflict of humanity to actually the Russian people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikael. Uh, I will uh, keep myself quite brief and uh, also um, uh, attempt to uh, formulate some questions to get our conversation started. Um, and I think one side that I, I'm curious about um, is this um, uh, reconstruction of uh, Sinfonia you, that you're talking about, Kirill. Uh, and, um, uh, because I, in my, from my view, at least from the church historian side of me, um, I would like to say that there are uh, different historical points where this reconstruction has happened within the Russian uh, Orthodox Church, uh, and uh, you, you're taking us back to the Second World War, but I also want to take us back to the First Tsar um, and uh, uh, Mikhail Fedorovich who reigned in 1613 to uh, 1645. Um, he became the first Tsar in Russia, as I understand it, because the Polish Empire was threatening Russia and the Moscovites uh, needed uh, this uh, ruler, uh, and, and he was, uh, became the Tsar. Um, however, interestingly, uh, it was also here that the type of very strong symphonia between the Tsar and the, um, and the Patriarch was established because who became the Patriarch? It, it was his father that became the Patriarch a couple of years after he became the first Tsar. Um, so the first Tsar was very much dominated by his father, Fedorovich Mikovich Romanov, um, from the year 1619. And these type of relationships have continued, not that the, the patriarch had been the actual father of the Tsar, but, but uh, there have been this type of relationships within history. And it's interesting then if we move to the 20th century and uh, Lenin enters the scene around 19, 1905, uh, he attempts a revolution at that point, but fails. Uh, he writes a document uh, which is called, I wrote it, wrote it down here, but um, Socialism and Religion, where he calls for the absolute separation of church and state. Um, and when he, ev he eventually succeeds in a revolution at 1917, or it's debated exactly what year and month it is, um, the, the patriarch at that point, Tichon, um, he is uh, uh, opposing the communists uh, and uh, on the ground that the motherland of Russia is the Orthodox Russia. So it's very much a sense of Russian identity that belongs and it, it's tied up with Russian Orthodoxy. Uh, and um, uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, the patriarch actually needs to, to um, uh, repent of this statement in uh, 1925, I think it is, or 23, uh, and he needs to, to show a type of support for, for the communist. But, uh, and as everyone knows, the communist then tries to erad eradicate the church, more or less. They are uh, destroying the, the theological educations, the churches, the, the uh, monasteries, and so on, and are very successful in that. 
however not successful enough in a sense because when the second world war as you are mentioning when that uh, uh, when when uh, when russia is attacked by germany stalin is actually calling upon the church again and the that current patriarch in 1943 to say that we uh, surely this is also uh, your battle to to fight uh, so the church of the Orthodox Church of Russia supports the Russian uh, war uh, against the Germans. And it's, according to some historians at least, an important side for the, the Russia uh, war morale at uh, that point. Uh, and the, the point I want to make is really that it's also this, symfo this symphonia uh, is tied up closely not simply as a church matter but closely as a russian identity now obviously this is something that you would know a lot more about but this from my perspective of of reading history in this uh, from this side it's very much a a, a, a issue of identity uh, which when the the current patriarch kirill is talking about this moral uh, war between east and west uh, it emphasizes this identity of where Russian is, uh, uh, they are the true moral human beings and the West are the uh, less moral and also in a sense less human beings um, than, uh, than the Russians. Uh, and interestingly, when we, we might think of, or I uh, might have thought of Russia as a very religious country because of this strong a link between the Russian Orthodox Church and uh, being a Russian. But when I, um, another church historian called John Burgess, uh, he, he looked at the statistics and it's that statistic points towards that is, uh, I think it was done uh, 2017, so it's not completely uh, the, uh, very cu uh, current, but quite current at least. Uh, about, he counts at about one to three percent of the Russian people are active in church activities. So in a sense, even less than, than Sweden. And that at Easter at that year, uh, 2017 or 2016, about 10% of Russian went to, to the Easter celebration, which is obviously the most important festival in the whole year. Uh, however, and perhaps differently from, from Sweden, uh, about 65 to 70 percent identify as Russian Orthodox of the Russian people. So this side of identity is really uh, strong in the in the mentality of the Russian people. Um, so I, I um, it would be interesting. Then, and the the question that I would like to to raise uh, is in many ways this reconstruction. There are strong points within history of this idea of the symphonia and it seems that the russian orthodox church i know that there are kind of dissenting voices uh, uh, andre uh, uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah uh, is uh, is opposing and are putting critique against the the patriarch um and and there are other uh, fairly uh, vocal voices that are, that are uh, critiquing um, but but this um, uh, this reconstruction is is seems to be quite strong uh, in order to to solidify this Russian identity uh, that if you are Russian you are Russian Orthodox um, and when I spoke to to my friend Sergey. Um, now because I'm standing here I forget his last name but he's uh, uh, Tim uh, Sean. Oh, yeah, Tim Checker. Um, he uh, he said that one problem is that in Ukraine at this moment, because of the separation that Michael was talking about of the Ukrainian Church um, and the the conflict at this point, uh, many Ukrainian Christians no longer see the Russian Orthodox Church what they are doing as Christians. So it's a separation, not simply of of um, um, it's not simply a, a idea of a, an ecumen a ecumenical problem. It's a, in a sense a problem of heresy for, for some of the Ukrainian churches. Um, 
uh, which I think is is an interesting question to pose to to you, Michael, in terms of if the union of the of the Orthodox Church or the call to union now is in Kiev, uh, then uh, how to what are the ways forward uh, when many uh, Ukrainian churches, many Ukrainian Christians, are seeing themselves as opposing something that is not even uh, within the church anymore. Uh, so, so that would be very interesting to, to raise that question. That is a very theologically fundamental separation between uh, some Christian congregations in Ukraine, what they are seeing uh, in the Church of Russia. Um, and I, I, in a sense, that was my that that are my my main points. I, um, I also want to mention that, of course, there are other traditions, particularly in Ukraine, uh, church traditions that are are struggling. And also, this is the the relationship that's been quite strong within free churches and Baptists between Ukraine and Russia uh, are also severed in many ways because they are. Uh, it seems to be that it's this identifying or this support or loyalty towards Putin that is taking overhand from the loyalty or support to the, uh, the, the fellow Christian congregations in, in Ukraine. So um, the, the free church leaders in, in Ukraine are also reacting strongly against their uh, peers in, in Russia because of this uh, loyalty towards Putin. So it seems like this symphonia is not only a problem for the Orthodox Church, it's also a problem for uh, free churches because it becomes a, a close link of identity between church and uh, Putin in this case. Um, so if this, to, where the ways forward towards uh, some sort of unity, uh, I also would like to, to ask uh, from, from you, Cyril, that uh, are there any theological resources with, within Orthodox Christianity that can somehow uh, construct a, a different relationship? I mean, it's very strong, this idea of symphonia, even if it's, reconstruct it's a reconstruction. Um, are the theological or are perhaps church political resources that can somehow uh, construct a different uh, future than what we what we see now. Uh, I I, um, uh, I am a little bit skeptic. I, what I see now, it's very difficult to see because there's a lot of emphasis on personal piety, not so much emphasis on on uh, uh, political critique. It seems like if we are if we are, should talk about symphonia in musical terms, you you said that we should not. But if if we would, it seems like there is no counterpoint. Uh, in order uh, that the, the church does not provide really a, anything of a counterpoint in this symphony, which is essential if we're going to have some sort of interesting symphony and not avoid uh, just have this um, elevator music that with no counterpoint. And and uh, but but maybe are there counterpoints that you see within Orthodox theology and church politics that that can somehow uh, uh, portray a different future. Um, I will stop there uh, and um, uh, it, I will be curious uh, to hear uh, what you what you say. And then we will also, of course, open up for for audience uh, questions as well. Uh, yes, I don't know if any one of you are interested in starting off with uh, with the question I post, but um, uh, let's see if we get. Is yeah, it, yeah. Can you can you hear me? I hope it is. It is being recorded as well. <clears throat> well, uh, Joseph, to your kind of last question, then I will go further to, yeah. uh, to the first questions. Well, speaking about the resources, I think they are in making mm -hmm. somehow, and uh, this war has become a real challenge and uh, also an opportunity, an opportunity for the theologians to develop some kind of argumentation which would go beyond this main line, uh, main, uh, mainstream uh, political theology produced by the official churches. Um, indeed, we are, what we are dealing with, it's a kind of a birth of, of the orthodox political theology. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, or a birth, if you want, of several political theologies. They come out like twins or triple, triples, mm -hmm. actually. Uh, of the two twins, um, the first one, they came out uh, from the womb of, you know, essential patristics, because the 
orthodox political theology is being born out of patristics. Uh, and this is the difference with, for example, the Protestant political theology, which is being born from the New Testament studies mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first um, of the twins, the first baby that came out of the womb of this patristic, it's quite monstrous. That is the sort of political theology that underpins this war. This is a nationalistic, uh, kind of imperialistic theology uh, promoted by, not just by the Russian patriarch, but also by some other church leaders. Uh, there is another, uh, uh, another baby coming out of that, uh, a twin brother or sister, rather sister, right? Theology is a female. Uh, of, uh, of this the political theology is, I think it's more healthy. It's something that we are trying to do uh, to develop a sort of political theology that stresses another kind of symphony. This is a sort of symphony that I advocate for. And this is a symphony to, not with the state, but with the civil society. I believe that is a kind of uh, a, a solution to the dilemmas, to the traditional dilemmas of the Orthodox churches. Well, to keep our beloved symphonies, we are not going to read, get rid of them but to redirect them at different partners, not the state, but the civil society. That I think would be a kind of via tertia, the third way for, mm. uh, for the Orthodox theology. But to... then if, uh, I mean, the, the exact numbers might change and might not be, but, uh, but if, the, um, if the link to, between church and civil society in the sense of church activity is that low, uh, are, there, are there signs of, of reinvigorated church activity that that uh, some congregations are, are or priests are are engaged in to yeah. to to make this contact well in russia we are having uh, we are dealing with two kind of simulacra uh, first simulacrum is the civil society there is no civil society in russia in order to have a partnership a symphony with the civil society first you have to have a civil society Right, uh, and uh, that is the problem for Russia. Mm. And the second simulacrum is this kind of relationship with the kind of civil society. Both are faked, mm. uh, but uh, I mean, in the narratives of say of the Russian church, they speak about the civil society. They say we are working with the civil society, even though this uh, civil society is strongly managed and uh, cannot you know, go beyond the control. Uh, it's a complete fake, it's a complete simulacrum and the relationship of the Russian church. So yeah, you can say that it is invigorated uh, somehow, but again, officially it is encouraged from the center. Mm -hmm. It doesn't come from the grassroots level from upside, uh, from, uh, you know, from down to up, it's, it comes from upside down. Um, the second point I wanted to say is about uh, that uh, this symphony applies not just to the Russian church. The Russian church has made, has produced a pattern for other religious groups and not just Catholics or evangelicals. And I, I agree that the evangelicals, they follow the same pattern. If you take uh, Bishop Sergei Ryakovsky, who represents evangelicals, I think, in, the, in, uh, in Russia, he is like a patriarch and he follows exactly the pattern of symphony you know of the byzantine symphony he's more, more byzantine even the, than many you know orthodox hierarchs and he's evangelical mm. um that's the second point and the third point uh, about michael's presentation actually i'm i'm a bit surprised uh, i should say um i really entertained myself because i had this idea that uh, I was watching a, a documentary movie on the first channel in Russia. <laughs> you know? uh, it's completely like a consistent narrative, which is kind of argumented somehow, uh, but it's exactly, it's a Russian narrative. And um, I think the main mistake of this narrative is that it confuses the reasons and the excuses. They are two different things. And Moscow is very skillful in playing by in playing by substituting reasons with excuses or excuses with reasons. For example, the war in Yugoslavia was not the reason of the Russian alienation from the West. It was an excuse. The reason was different. The reason was exactly to the desire to build a new empire to restore the Soviet Union. And Yugoslavia and the unwise bombardment of Yugoslavia provided an excellent excuse to Russia. But Michael, in your presentation, it is a reason. No, it's an excuse. That's a, that is a mistake. And uh, there are some other kind of manipulations around reasons and mistakes that uh, the Russian narratives are very you know, skillful in producing. I will stop here. 
Yeah, that's what I hoped that you would react on. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I don't agree, of course. <laughs> Uh, I don't think that uh, Russia is acting just because of building an empire. I don't think that's enough to explain it. There's a real fear also. There's a fear of ha having an uh, entire NATO against them to be isolated. And, and that's also the rhetoric that is used out today against Russia, which increases the war. People are using the conflict also for increasing tensions and creating new borderlines and boundaries between the, the, uh, the worlds. Uh, I don't believe that the Russian world as such exists in a metaphysical sense, but I do believe that there are enough uh, bonds between Belarusians and Russians and Ukrainians. Like if you go back to the Nordic countries, uh, the second poorest country in Europe between the two world wars was Norway. The reason why Sweden let Norway go, so to say, that was because it was poor when the discussion was going on. Uh, the question here now, when it comes to Ukraine, there are several interests in Donbas when it comes to natural resources, a lot of other things coming, coming for gas. It is a real threat against Russia. It's not just an imperial uh, uh, structure that is built here. It's, uh, I would change it. I would say the opposite, that the structure of an empire is an ideological defense that is now aligned with fear. A fear that is not really real either. So I would agree that that is a fear that is not completely set in a kind of, of, of uh, isolationism. But um, Russia has been pointed out as an enemy. Uh, Kirill, um, Putin was elected because uh, the acts in uh, Serbia made his potential position possible. So there is a direct link with what happened in Serbia. Okay, just very simple. Putin was elected in nineteen in two thousand. Well, elected, he was promoted, uh, and he started the second Chechen war, as you know. Uh, that Chechen, second Chechen war, not the Yugoslavia conflict, the second Chechen, Chechen war uh, actually boosted his legitimacy, made him recognized and, and accepted by the Russian society. And the prelude to the Chechen, second Chechen war, where the blasting of the houses, civil houses in Volgograd and other places and in Moscow, and people believe, most people believe that it was a sta uh, staged by Putin himself. So he staged a war he, he uh, ran into the war without any reason. He destroyed Chechnya, and he said that is out of fear of, you know, of the Chechens. He created this fear. He created the pretext of the war. He justified his war by this pretext, and he started this war. It's not a fear. It's just a manipulation. The same as, can you mention at least one threat from the West to Putin, except what Putin said about the threats? I don't recall any. So it's not, well, that's just an example how it works. And uh, I disagree completely with this argumentation. Yeah, yeah I, I won't continue too much on this, but, but uh, <clears throat> the manufacturing of the idea that uh, everything can be explained what has happening in, in, in Putin's head, that's actually, that's a kind of conspiracy theory, right? Yeah, isn't it also a sociopolitical context? how people react, how people believe, how people understand their world, not just what Putin is uh, delivering. He's also in, in a kind of situation where he needs a kind of political situation to be elected and, and right? Yeah, that's how propaganda works. Of course, he makes people to believe in this way. Exactly. But, but do you really think that he's so, so capable that they can trans, transfer entire heads of the populations? Well, probably they do, yes. Uh, yeah. And, um, well, you take Germany. What happened to Germany? I mean, can you believe that the nation that produced, you know, Kant and Hegel, and you know, the 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 most philosophical nation in the world, could end up where it ended up, brainwashed? Was it possible, or it, it was just a, you know, uh, they really were threatened by the Western countries, by the Jews, or were Jews the real threat to them? Uh, I, uh, it would be interesting here at least to because uh, it's it's I think it's strong to say conspiracy theory when 
Putin uh, published this uh, article on on the un unity of of the Russian or the the greater Russia or so on, on and said that Ukraine is not the, their own uh, country. It's it's Russian, and I mean it's uh, it's not it's not like uh, Cyril needs to to uh, impose what is going on in Putin's head. It's he, Putin was more or less a preparing for these type of uh, these type of this type of uh, invasion and conflict by by uh, putting out his idea of of a fake a fake historical construction of of uh, of what the greater russia is so that's surely not a conspiracy theory it's it's somewhere along the line of wanting to manipulate a a, a or at least construct their own story for a uh, for a political action yeah, but the thing is that uh, you cannot explain the, the the emotional feelings, the negative reactions against NATO in Serbia, in Russia, and in other parts of the world, just by saying that they are manipulated. That's not the case. No, there are sociopolitical reasons why people feel that there are reasons why they should support Putin. It's not just a cause because of manipulation or propaganda. I've already mentioned one reason. The bombings in Serbia. That created a rift between East and West again. It created a new Cold War. No, I think it's, it's wrong. Yeah, but uh, yes. Please say why. Yeah, because very simple. For example, uh, Ukraine was a part of the Soviet Union, right? Uh, Ukraine was also uh, in the same boat with Russia, you know, for centuries, literally, right? Uh, we had the same kind of prejudice. We had the same kind of Soviet mentality. We still have the same kind of Soviet mentality. And quite surprisingly, well, in a sense, we are, you know, we are not the same people, but we understand each other very well. And this war did not alienate Ukraine. It alienated only Russia, because in Russia, I remember, do you remember this kind of Primakov's turn over the Atlantic? It happened exactly after the bombardment of, uh, of Serbia. Primakov was flying, he was the prime minister. I think it was, yeah, the prime minister of Russia, he was flying to, uh, to DC from Moscow. And then he made this U-turn over Atlantic and came back, uh, uh, came back to Russia. And he was of course praised. Uh, and that's how, uh, yeah, it, he, he, he became a, a, a huge kind of pub, publicly supported person. Evgeny Primakov, he was a kind of the main, the senior figure in KGB. And um, uh, he started uh, his political career, essentially. He became electable for the president. He aligned himself with Lushkov, the mayor of Moscow. There was a, a political combination between the two of them. And actually, they became a threat to Yeltsin because it was the last year of Yeltsin. And uh, uh, there was a threat that this kind of narrative of anti-West, anti-Western, anti-American would um, become really, uh, re would resonate with the uh, popular resentment about, you know, about the uh, losing the Cold War, and they became uh, a threat to the Yeltsin's regime. That's how Putin was promoted. Putin was promoted exactly to counterpose, to counterweight against this duo between Primakov and Lushkov. And Putin uh, was promoted exactly with this. He tried to play the same game, anti-Western, but from the different camp, the Yeltsin's family camp. So essentially, he took over uh, this political momentum created by this U-turn of, of Primakov over the Atlantic. And he created um, a new narrative against, again, anti-Western because he, well, the, the group behind him, Putin was not really a real political figure at the time, but the group, KGB group behind him, started exploiting this kind of uh, fear. Uh, my, I think there is a similarity between the German resentment against the World War I, losing World War I, and scapegoating Jews. Uh, to excuse, you know, Nazism. Can you say that the Jews were completely innocent? There were, were instances of exploitation, but they used this as a pretext uh, to justify their Nazism. That's why, I'm, I mean, this uh, resentment in, Germ in, in, in Germany was exactly uh, when uh, an excuse was played as a reason for, uh, for Nazism. You can say, yes, uh, I, I agree that the bombardment of Yugoslavia was wrong. 
I agree with that. I completely disagree that it really triggered the resentment. No, it became a, you know, a point of the, a condensation somehow. It was already dense in the air, this anti-Western resentment. And particularly the resentment about the fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet empire. And they try to find any excuse. Some, some, sometimes they invent the excuses. All this threat of NATO, it's an invention, I believe. Because can you, can someone name a, a, a single threat from NATO to Russia against Russia, except what they say, then NATO absorbed all those countries in Eastern Europe. They decided to go there because they had this experience of, of uh, occupation in the Soviet era. They, they knew what they're dealing with and it was their choice. And when people say that the NATO expanded at the expense of, you know, at the expense of Russia, uh, it was a threat to Russia. No, it was the choice of people who joined, who wanted to join the NATO, and they just ignore the agency of of the people. That's why the same they say about Ukraine. They say Ukraine, you know, it's just um, a puppet in the Western hands. And the West now fights, wages a war against Russia through Ukraine, as it waged the war against Russia in the Maidan, you know, during the Revolution of Dignity, as if the Ukrainian people didn't exist and didn't, didn't want anything, didn't play any role without agency, you know, just puppets, literally. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of uh, argumentation which is behind, uh, behind this imagined threat. I think it's a complete kind of uh, manipulation. To, just to uh, enter in, I think that's in a sense the danger of this uh, emphasis on, on simply personal piety and this moral uh, war against East and West, because, uh, because obviously if the Ukrainians have become influenced by the West and, that, uh, and the, the demasculating effects of, of the Western morality and homosexuality and so on, then obviously they are puppets in, in, the, in this type of, of logic from uh, from uh, simply having a, a very rigid idea of what personal Christian piety would would entail, so in a way that simply it simply plays out this type of theology that that is promoted from a, from a, from a Russian Orthodox or a, a high point or a high position from Russian Orthodox uh, priests. So so in a way, Ukrainians they don't have their own will. If as the more Western they are, the less willful they will they will be but uh, so. should we open up for questions perhaps uh, thank you for your interventions and an interesting discussion i was just waiting for you not looking to each other all the time but out to us also so that's thank you for <laughs> opening up for us if i understand you correctly i can see that you have two different scenarios somehow one is maybe a uniting Russian people, the Russians must be one. And the other is you are talking about Putin reconstructing the Byzantine Empire. He is more or less the new Basilev, the new empire. If you guess or try to draw, draw conclusions out of these scenarios in a geographical perspective, what would be the next steps? What should be included in Russians is for one, or what is included in the Byzantine Empire? Is it the same geographical area Putin are aspiring, according to your two different ways of expressing it? First of all, I don't have another scenario. I think Father Cyril is uh, misconceiving me or doesn't understand me. I am uh, arguing that to understand the situation, uh, you have to reflect upon uh, not just manipulation and ideology and theories. You also need to look at the sociopolitical situation. And uh, there's a lot of uh, polls we have made, uh, both with the Levada Institute and other not the Pew Institute, that reveals that Russia has a very strong uh, evolvement of what we call anomi, a sense of feeling meaningless which uh, triggers emotions and feelings and theories. And exactly as uh, Cyril said, that there is a fear that is misused in Russia. And it's fear that is misused by the Patriarch Kirill in this situation. Uh, but the sociopolitical situation cannot be taken away by ideology. You cannot create peace just by saying that we had two various ideologies or even scenarios. 
peace has been made on various aspects and various dimensions. Uh, and one of these dimensions is to understand that the fear is not just an effect of manipulation. The fear is also uh, something that is real, uh, both in Serbia and in Russia. There is real fear uh, for NATO. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's accurate or what, uh, what the reasons are, but it's a real fear. My scenario is that building a peaceful environment in the area where the Ukraine and Russia and Belarus is uh, coinciding it needs more than just an ideological answer. That's my scenario. Yeah. Well, um, in this situation, there are only two scenarios. Uh, one scenario, Russia wins, and uh, the other scenario is Russia gets defeated. Russia loses. There are, there are no others. I don't see any other scenario at the moment. Because even if there would be a truce, that truce will be, would be buried temporarily. It will be a truce just to resume the war again. And it seems that the only um, uh, pacifier, the only kind of thing that uh, can quench the fear of Russians, of the Russians nowadays, is to start a war. Yeah, you can say that they, they, they've been uh, uh, well, I believe that they've been instructed to fear, and they believe the only way to react is to start the war. So if you really try to, to perceive them from this perspective, what the Germans call put, uh, Putin Verständnis, the understanders of Putin, is just try to appease that fear, to feed this fear, which means just to, to, to let them go to war. Because it seems that the only way they get satisfied, kind of get rid of their fear if, if they assault, if they uh, kind of exercise aggression. And uh, it's not the first time that this aggression has happened. Uh, remember the first Ukrainian Republic, which was established in 1918, and it was destroyed in 1921 with the same pretexts, with the same methods. It was just, you know, Ukraine was just uh, occupied by, by the Soviets, or the Russians or the Soviets. You name them. Uh, then uh, they destroyed Ukraine in Holodomor in the 30s. What kind of fear did they have? They had a fear of that the Ukrainians would rebel eventually. That's why they, they killed like 7 million Ukrainians in, in the famine. The same kind of, you name, you can invent all sorts of fear that they may have. But this fear ends up with the destruction of the neighbor, neighbors all the time. I don't see how you can, you know, how can you, can you uh, just deal with that. Uh, uh, certainly the, the kind of uh, feeding their fear or appeasing their fear is not the way because it's, it ends up usually in the war or, any, uh, or other tragedies. Uh, if I may butt in on that question, I think in a sense it's, um, it's not a, as much about geography as it is about history, I would say, but maybe because I'm a church historian, I would, <laughs> would say that. But, but if we look at, for example, how Putin have, have incorporated Stalin in, in the idea of a greater Russia and the Russian motherland and so on, then, uh, and if we look at what Lenin and Stalin were doing in their view of, of the motherland Russia and the Tsarist regime, uh, I mean, Putin has been incredibly creative with his history so obviously uh, what if if Putin remains in power then obviously he can construct a history that suits whatever geographical uh, expansion or decrease that happens so I I in my view it, it belongs very much to a, a who and again I think that reconstruction term is really essential here because it depends on who reconstructs uh, how to understand the whatever geographical realm uh, Putin has after this or, or wants to expand to. Uh, so it's very much about writing the, the story about Russia. Uh, and and he he's, seems to be very flexible uh, in, in how to understand that, that story. Yes, do you want to? Sarah? Uh, yeah, great. Yeah, um, just one moment. Uh, hello. 
so I, I got curious about something that Father Cyril said about um, a kind of a rebirth of, um, of theology in Russia. And I was thinking about the development of theology in Germany after the Second World War and how many German theologians really have tried to come to grips with many of the difficulties of what happened in the war. Um, and I wonder if, if you would envision something similar or could foresee something similar in Russia when this war well is over. I think it's a very uh, it's a very important question indeed uh, because I, I see the only way uh, uh, as from the deadlock theological deadlock where we ended up is to follow the patterns of the post-war uh, theology in the Protestant and Catholic Church um, uh, amalgamated properly this theology after Auschwitz by Jürgen Moltmann or Vatican II theology uh, in the Catholic Church uh, with the Orthodox Church has never had this kind of uh, adjournment of this kind of uh, rethinking of, of political theology. And for us, I think it's an opportunity now to reconstruct, uh, to deconstruct the old uh, political theologies that led to, to this war and to uh, construct new ones. Uh, probably we don't need to necessarily to invent, you know, a bike. Uh, we need to use the kind of already invented uh, devices. And uh, um, I, I also believe that it is a huge ecumenical momentum uh, for uh, the Orthodox theology and the Catholic and the Protestant theologists to somehow join the efforts to um, try to address uh, the sort of bad political theology that underpins this war, as, as well as other wars, actually, because if you take any war, and actually, uh, we are talking about this war 2022, but there was this, this is a new, a new war. This war started in 2014. There was a war in Georgia in 28. Uh, with the same powers playing role, you know, the, the only wars we had in Europe so far in the 21st century were the wars be between the Orthodox nations with some kind of a religious Orthodox rhetoric employed to justify them or to rebuke them. Uh, so it seems that the pattern kind of repeats itself, the pattern, and it continues, and we probably need eventually to address it, uh, the pattern itself, and I think that uh, this kind of ideology, theology cannot be rebuked just you know, thrown away in, into the basket uh, just as, you know, as rubbish. Uh, yeah, a good sign. Uh, but also, uh, um, it cannot be uh, addressed through the secular perspective. Like, they would say, aha, you see, you religious people are crazy. You need to be, you need just to disappear. You have nothing to do with our world. You only do harm. That is kind of a sort of argumentation that is very plausible in this situation. It is already heard, right? I think it is a wrong way out of this deadline because uh, de deadlock. Uh, just to throw away religion or political theology, any political theology doesn't help. What helps is to suggest another kind of political theology based on the same tradition. Uh, maybe to find uh, what they, they called in France, ressourcement, like the resourcement. Of tradition, I think uh, that was the very much the idea behind the Sousketian uh, uh, initiative uh, in the Catholic Church and other uh, initiatives to publish, you know, the resources, the patristic resources, biblical resources, essentially to use the sources of the tradition in order to rebuild the modern concepts. I think we, we need this kind of resource resource more in the Orthodox tradition to get to draw from our own resources to construct a new sort of political theology. And I believe it should not be just an orthodox business. It should be really ecumenical. Yeah, I do. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, is a problem here is this vertical hierarchy that uh, Patrick Kirill is emphasizing. This kind of vertical involves protection. And nobody wants to be protected by someone who is on top of you. It's, it's not a right protection. Uh, this vertical hierarchy exists not just in Russia, but it exists in the area as such. Uh, we need a horizontal relationship in the area. A horizontal relationship means that people need to be live in unity based on mutual understanding and uh, consensus. Uh, which we would say in a Western world uh, today, uh, democracy. 
And this vertical hierarchy uh, that is uh, started, uh, started to evolve, especially after the fall of the Soviet Union, it has rapidly evolved. Uh, you can see it in the authoritativeness that exists in Russia, that uh, that's side of anomie, an anomic society where you believe in, of, uh, in distant authorities. You know, 73 percentage supports Putin. Uh, I don't remember exactly the last poll for, for how many supports uh, Patrick here, but they support distant authorities. And this is very common in, in societies that have evolved in this kind of vertical hierarchy. I don't believe that we are talking about uh, a solution only in uh, who is winning the war. Uh, that's not enough. It's one first step maybe. But I think that in the long-term solution, it needs an internal development. And I think the Ukraine has the initiative in this. Ukraine is closest to develop a more horizontal uh, way of uh, relating to the neighbors, to the West, and to other parts of the world. Russia is far off from this. They're still working in a very vertical way of responding to other uh, parts of the world, especially to the West. It's always about who is most powerful. Uh, the Nordic countries have done their part. Sweden had this relationship to Norway and Finland. They had a vertical protection of Finland and Norway. And still, Norwegians and Finnish people still have memories of this. It's a cultural memory that still exists in Norway and in Finland. Uh, that memory will also continue to exist after the war. People will not accept Russians for a generation or two generations from this. But the internal work in Kiev and Ukraine is important to develop a democratic way, a democratic mentality, that's a necessity. If Ukraine wants to move towards, not just to the West, but also to move towards an alternative way of living and existing. And that is also kind of, of a sequel to the war, to continue to work with the civil society, to develop what the, uh, uh, Cyril Lavarun is saying, to develop like an existing civil society. And that's Ukraine's initiative. And that's why I believe that the initiative for any kind of unit in this area has returned to Ukraine. I mean, it, my uh, my relationship to Ukraine is fairly young uh, because I was supposed to, uh, I was there for uh, uh, invited to be part of a, or start up an ecumenical work between uh, some of the churches in, in uh, Kiev. But I find what is interesting is that uh, there is this uh, ecumenical will uh, within the many of the churches in uh, in Ukraine. So in that sense, if that might continue, and I suppose this war uh, will probably galvanize the unity within uh, Ukraine for Ukrainians because you have a common enemy, of course. Uh, but I think that can that ecumenical side of of uh, of the churches in Ukraine is very exciting if one wants to look at theological, uh resourcement or, or renewments and and uh, things because i think that's where uh, it's most likely will will appear uh, and uh, i think cyril is too humble to say that but obviously he and and also therefore in in uh, uh, are part of this exciting new political theology within orthodox uh, theology so so uh, he wouldn't mention that himself, perhaps, but but that's uh, I think that's an answer to to your question, Sara, as well. Uh, that uh, look at at Cyril's work and as, at Davos' work on political theology, and that might uh, what what actually then develops into new Maltmans and new uh, new uh, post-crisis theology is, of course, extremely difficult to to answer. Uh, it's you, we cannot look at the future and, and say what, what will happen, but yeah. Then I think we're done with this session. Uh, it's a couple of minutes before uh, 4 p.m. I thank you all for uh, joining us in this discussion. And uh, I think this is the last day of the World uh, Academic Forum Stockholm Summit. So I think tomorrow it's over. I think so. So thank you so much.